They say there are three guarantees in life. Taxes, except if you're super wealthy. Death, unless you're heiress. And politicians peddling pseudoscience in order to weaponize zealots and seize power. Well, mainly on the far right. Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, and Marjorie Taylor Greene are not flukes, but perfect examples of how conservative politicians have become aggressively anti-science and why it's incredibly important to vote. Today, we'll be focusing on these three candidates and covering the climate change and abortion conversations as case studies in the effects of science misinformation in politics. Welcome to Bad Astra. sweater. Oh, good girl. Hello again, astronauts. I noticed there are a lot more of you after our Gabby Hanna video. Welcome to our Wacky Science channel, where we talk about space, physics, and combat science misinformation with more costume changes than math. I'm Astra. I have a BA in physics, an MS in mechanical engineering, and a habit of obsessively researching commenter questions and listening to too many political podcasts. Eris, a chaotic witch and our writer, is responsible for a lot of our more high concept videos and has started appearing more often on screen. My wife Nova is the smart one and is finishing up her PhD in astrophysics. And of course, the most important bad astro contributor is Neutrino. Say hi, Neutrino. Good girl. As always, thank you so much for watching our wacky science videos, and we'd really appreciate it if you like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. I read them all and try to respond to most of them. If you really love our videos and want to support us paying for increasingly elaborate costumes, props, location, film equipment, and bribery treats, we have a Patreon where you can sign up to get early access to our videos, behind the scenes updates, blooper reels, and other fun perks. Also, we have stickers now. Every one of our patrons, as of Thanksgiving, will get a Bad Astra sticker mailed to them. They're great for sticking on phone cases, water bottles, laptops. Yes, mm. they don't taste as good as my nose, apparently. Okay, back on topic. I don't wanna to spend too much time on the COVID-19 pandemic, but I'd be remiss not to bring it up because it's a really clear modern example of the effects of science denial. Early pandemic denial, as well as anti-mask and anti-lockdown rhetoric and policies from the right, contributed to the virus's spread and led to overwhelmed hospitals and thousands of additional deaths. Anti-vaccine rhetoric and behavior, also spread and encouraged by the right wing, has caused an estimated 319,000 extra deaths. Getting vaccinated and getting boosted not only lowers your chance of getting COVID, but lowers your chance of getting extremely sick and of passing COVID on to someone else. So what is free and can prevent the equivalent of French Guiana's population from dying? Vaccines! Where is French Guiana? Is it there? No, it's there. Oh yeah, make me feel inferior for not knowing niche geography trivia that I could easily look up, British zaddy. Yeah, put me in my place by telling me I'm not nerdy enough for the only show I would watch before Lower Decks. And those deaths have impacted conservative communities more. Because masking, social distancing, and vaccines only work if everyone takes part, it's more practical to look at entire communities than individual behavior. Although the early days of COVID seemed to hit blue areas hardest, because population densities in cities are higher and cities tend to have more airports, blue areas were quickly able to flatten the curve through city lockdowns and mask mandates. By the end of 2020, COVID had gotten to rural areas, and despite their massive advantage of generally lower population densities, 
the death rate caught up in Trump country due to a lack of masks and conscious social distancing. When vaccines were slowly rolled out, Trump voting areas had higher death rates, but not by much. Lockdowns were being lifted and vaccinated people were going out more. Lollapalooza happened again, despite everyone in Chicago hating Lollapalooza. Then the Delta and Omicron waves hit. Delta felt like nothing to me. No one I knew was getting very sick. But in red counties, the death toll was skyrocketing. Why? Was it because people weren't taking measures to protect themselves, like wearing masks and getting vaccinated, even though their poorly spray tanned leader was vaccinated and wearing a mask himself? Then Omicron hit and half of America got COVID. I had to push back my wedding again because a ton of guests had COVID, but no one, not even guests over 80 were getting seriously sick. But in red counties, Omicron was continuing to wipe people out. Wouldn't it have been nice to have an ample supply of PPE in case of a pandemic? Oops, Trump decided it wasn't important, so here we are. All of us need to be in therapy after 2020. My coping strategies include a puppy and escaping into the mountains whenever I feel like society's a drag. It's been a week, so bye. If you are watching this video and aren't vaccinated, welcome. I encourage you to watch our vaccine videos from March 2021 if you have questions about the vaccine. I'm personally fully vaccinated and twice boosted, feel great, and am incredibly lucky to have a social circle where no one I know personally has died due to COVID, in large part because they social distance, masked up, and got vaccinated. Thanks, vaccines! Thanks, vaccines! Eris still hasn't gotten COVID, but she did get shingles. Weird. We all learned from COVID that science misinformation and anti-science policies are deadly. But in this video, I'd like to focus on two other present science issues, also with deadly consequences, climate change and abortion. I was considering adding transphobia to that list because it belongs there, but there are far more qualified trans creators who have covered this topic far better than I can. Jesse Gender, Riley J. Dennis, Fantastic Mr. Fox, ContraPoints, Philosophy Tube, and Aranok are all fantastic trans creators who have done great work, both debunking transphobic misinformation and demonstrating how anti-trans policies are not only bigoted and wrong, but have deadly consequences. You should subscribe to all of them. Also, their other non-transphobia related videos are awesome as well. I am a big fan of all of their channels. Let's start with the existential threat to humanity, climate change. Climate change. Climate change is not only real, but expensive and deadly. Extreme weather events are growing more common each year. In 2020, there were 22 extreme weather events that caused damage in the United States that exceeded a billion dollars each, a new annual record that shattered the previous record of 16 events that happened in both 2011 and 2017. With the backdrop of a deadly pandemic, Americans last year had to flee their homes in the face of out of control wildfires and an unprecedented number of hurricanes and seek shelter from sweltering heat waves, events that exacerbate already troubling racial and economic inequalities. Again, after 2020, we all need therapy. Yes, you make everything better. Mm -hmm. I love you. <laughs> yes. Oh, she's not here for you. She's here for me. Recently, Democrats passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes billions of dollars for fighting climate change. Is that enough? No, not even close. It's a tiny, pitiful step forward. It is, however, the largest step forward on climate the U.S. has ever taken, with zero Republican senators supporting the plan because, you know, they don't like living on a habitable planet? No, that doesn't sound right. Oh, yes, money. But more on that later. So what do Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, and Marjorie Taylor Greene have to say about this plan and climate change in general? We in America, you have some of the cleanest air and cleanest water of anybody in the world. Yes, so what we do is we're going to put from the Green New Deal 
millions or billions of dollars cleaning our good air up. So all of a sudden, China and India ain't putting nothing in there cleaning that situation up. So all that bad air is still there. But since we don't control the air, our good air decided to float over to China, bad air. <laughs> so when China gets our good air, that bad air got to move. <laughs> so it moves over to our good air space. And now we got to clean that back up. Of the $370 billion of climate change and energy spending, one billion will go toward the Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Program. Walker didn't like that, saying, a lot of the money is going into trees. We've got enough trees. Don't we have enough trees around here? No, Walker, we don't have enough trees. That's kind of the problem. We are currently editing a video about the positive impacts of nature on your brain, where scientists show that not only is access to green space like trees important for your health, but urban areas do not, in fact, have enough green space. Planting trees in urban areas prolongs the lives and improves the quality of life of the people living in those neighborhoods. So even though this was Walker's cherry-picked example designed to minimize the climate plan's scope, he literally chose an example with immediate health consequences for lower-income people. Dr. Oz, who used to accept the scientific consensus of climate change when he was a TV show quack, has gone into full denial now that he's running for Senate as a Republican. As a scientist, I'll tell you the Green New Deal is a lie. Reminder that as a medical doctor who is somehow still licensed is not a climate scientist. Nova is an astrophysicist, but shouldn't be asked to set a bone or diagnose a concussion. Carbon dioxide, my friends, is 0.04% of our air. That's not the problem. CO2 is 0.04% of our atmosphere. Interesting point. But as a medical doctor, Dr. Oz might know that a fatal dose of cyanide, estimated at around three milligrams per kilogram of body weight, is just 0.0003%. So maybe despite being 60% H2O himself, Dr. Oz's arguments don't hold water. Then there's Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's gone full galaxy brain and says that climate change is good, actually. We've already warmed one degree Celsius, and do you know what's happened since then? Here, let me tell you. We have had more food grown since mm. then, which feeds people. We are able to, producing fossil fuels keeps people's houses warm in the winter. That saves people's lives. People die in the cold. Right. This, this this earth warming and, and, and carbon is, is actually healthy for us. No, climate change is not good, actually. Extreme weather events like hurricanes, forest fires, monsoons, flooding, tornadoes, and extreme snowstorms kill and displace people and are becoming a lot more common. Food insecurity is on the rise in part due to climate change. She's just deliberately saying things that are demonstrably false which is lying. Or to give her the benefit of the doubt, maybe she's just that deeply brainwashed and uneducated. But that should also disqualify her from holding any position of power. Yes, but you make everything better. Yes, you do. Yes, you do make everything better. Did I just choose the kookiest clickbait candidates to make a point? Well, who doesn't love a good roast? And more importantly, these three are not the only ones. Currently, in the 117th Congress, 139 Congress people, a 52% majority of House Republicans and a 60% majority of Senate Republicans still actively deny the scientific consensus of human-caused climate change. And this is technically an improvement from 150 in the last Congress. Baby steps forward are still steps forward. I wonder if the $61 million in lifetime contributions they've collectively received from the coal, oil, and gas industries might have any effect on their beliefs. <sighs> and even though there's a strong minority of Republicans who aren't active climate deniers, not a single Republican senator supported the climate plan. So what does that minority propose? even slower incrementalist policies. 
And while that might be steps forward, we would die by the time their ant-sized steps got us anywhere close to a solution. This minority is embracing the shift from outright denying climate change, which is no longer feasible given the estimated deaths caused by climate change, ranging from a quarter million to five million every year. Extreme hot and cold temperatures and natural disasters are killing and displacing people faster than Ted Cruz can get to Cancun. Yes, we can be mad at Joe Manchin. It's one of my favorite hobbies, seeing as he's secretly two Republicans in a trench coat, but Maybe voting out literally any Republican senator would be more effective. The Trump presidency rolled back almost 100 environmental regulations. The conservative Supreme Court kneecapped the EPA in West Virginia v. the Environmental Protection Agency. In March, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell called on federal regulators to kill requirements to consider greenhouse gas emissions of natural gas pipelines before approving construction. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy released a climate plan with no emissions reductions target or proposed policies to reduce emissions. Their plan is businesses will innovate, a blatant stall tactic which ignores that coal, oil, and automobile corporations have a history of buying up and burying competing patents, and that innovation is driven by a profit motive under capitalism, assuming you're not dealing with a monopoly in a trench coat. Needless to say, this plan is not a high priority for them. But even if this plan had a minuscule chance of becoming legislation, that legislation would be toothless. So while I agree that the Inflation Reduction Act isn't close to enough, I'm not going to pretend that both sides are equally bad. One side wants to put a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. The other is actively shooting the patient, which would explain the NRA's upcoming campaign for more guns in hospitals. Wouldn't that be a horrible headline that sounds too legit to be a literal joke? <laughs> NRA, please don't get any ideas. Showing up to vote in the midterms and electing Democrats won't solve climate change, but it's a necessary step and the clear action you can take in the next couple weeks. And less climate change is better. Climate scientists estimate we've got until about 2030 to stay under an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there's significant damage mitigation beyond that point because each half degree matters. Even if all we can do is limit climate change from three degrees to two and a half degrees or two degrees, that's potentially billions of people who aren't displaced. Yes, I'd much rather have the Green New Deal or something that went even further, but the Green New Deal's biggest democratic attack was that they couldn't pass it, despite the plan's approval rating being 31 points up with supporters including virtually all Democratic voters, most independent voters, and a third of Republican voters. Joe Manchin, Susan Collins, and Kristen Sinema aren't the reasons we didn't pass the Green New Deal. Having a majority so slim that any one of them can single-handedly block legislation or get outsized concessions by dragging their feet is the problem. In our Gabby Hanna video, we talked about how reducing the global population, not by genocide please, would in turn reduce carbon emissions and reduce climate change. Studies show that given options, people will choose to have fewer children. Because I'm trying to get this video out quickly, I'm going to cite the same source as last time. A 2017 study showed that voluntarily lowering fertility rates through strategies such as improved healthcare, education, and economic opportunity for women and girls would result in a 35% reduction in emissions by 2100. Project Drawdown notes that improving the health and education of women and girls globally would better equip them for the climate crisis, with the side effect of saving 85 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent due to the slowing population growth. Yep, that's our transition to the forced birth or nonsense part of this video. If you haven't already watched our video on pregnancy, miscarriages, and abortion, I recommend you do because we worked very hard on it and tried to address and debunk a ton of medical misinformation fueling the debate surrounding bodily autonomy. TLDR, healthcare, including reproductive healthcare, including abortion care, is not only a human right, but imperative for a free society. Yes, you're a good girl. I'm just gonna hold you for this bit because mommy's stressed, okay? And you seem to want to be held. I love you.
In Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court, newly stacked with conservative and clearly partisan justices, and enjoying its highest disapproval rating ever, overturned the Roe v. Wade decision and gutted the 14th Amendment. This not only made abortion illegal in many states with trigger laws, but also called into question the safety of gay marriage, interracial marriage, contraception, and gay sex. So what do Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, and Marjorie Taylor Greene have to say about this decision and abortion rights in general? Herschel Walker compares abortion to murder and wants it banned with no exceptions, including to save the life of the pregnant person. Which is not only horrible, but hypocritical, given his history of pressuring girlfriends to get abortions and in one case, paying for one. Allegedly, since Walker denies the claims, but the woman in question did provide a receipt, a check from Walker, and a get well soon card signed by him for the procedure. And Walker also lies about everything, including once stating that he ran six hospitals and that he was a gun-carrying police officer. But the hypocrisy and lies don't matter to Republicans. As Dana Loesch says, So I don't care if Herschel Walker paid to abort endangered baby eagles. I want control of the Senate. If the Daily Beast story is true, you're telling me Walker used his money to reportedly pay some skank for an abortion and Warnock wants to use all of our monies to pay a whole bunch of skanks for abortions. I want to clarify that paying for your partner's abortion is great if you both agree that you don't want a pregnancy at this time. It's what a supportive partner does and I would applaud a friend for doing that. Paying for a stranger's abortion is great because healthcare is expensive. And by the way, if you'd like to do just that, donating to the National Network of Abortion Funds is a great place to start. The issue here is Walker believing that he himself is above the law so he can restrict the rights of others for political expediency. Oh wait, that's the entire platform of the Republican Party. Dr. Oz is also incredibly dangerous believing that life starts at conception. At a teletown hall, Oz stated, I do believe life starts at conception. And I said that multiple times. My mother-in-law is an ordained minister. My mother-in-law wrote a lot of the original pro-life literature in Montgomery County. My argument in that, uh, that radio interview was as a doctor, the heart starts beating at around nine weeks. So I was concerned that if legislators picked a time frame that's not medically accurate, it would invalidate the law. But also, if life starts at conception, why did you care what age the heart starts beating at? It's so, you know, it's not risk to murder if you were to, to, to terminate a child, whether the heart's beating or not. Although Dr. Oz was talking about abortion and stated he believes there should be exceptions to protect the life of the pregnant person, the repeated life begins at conception line, including on his campaign website, also has dangerous implications for IVF and people who miscarry, which we've covered in the abortion video. But it's not like there are already horror stories of people having miscarriages and just continuing to bleed out because the hospital can't perform a life-saving medical procedure without consulting a lawyer first. Oh wait. Marjorie Taylor Greene celebrated the Dobbs decision and goes further than either Walker or Oz, tweeting, Roe is overturned and we are one step closer to ending the mass genocide of abortion in America. Greene called the decision the beginning of the end, which props to her for getting it so wrong she actually got it right, and declared her wish for a nationwide ban on abortion. Georgia, which has a six-week abortion ban, but has decriminalized abortion in Savannah and Atlanta is not enough for Green. <sighs> so much for all the Republicans using states' rights arguments. We always have people like Green to say the quiet part out loud. Now make them say why they rep the losers team with all those Confederate flags. These aren't the only three Republicans against reproductive freedom. Let's go through some quotes, shall we? I'm only going to include quotes from the past year or so made by active representatives or candidates since we're focusing on current politicians. And this is a very condensed list. Remember, all of these people are in charge of making decisions that directly impact your lives and your rights. 
House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy of California's 23rd, House Republican Whip Steve Scalise of Louisiana's 1st, and House Republican Conference Chair Elise Stefanik of New York's 21st issued the following response to the Dobbs decision. Every unborn child is precious, extraordinary, and worthy of protection. We applaud this historic ruling, which will save countless innocent lives. The Supreme Court is right to return the power to protect the unborn to the people's elective representatives in Congress and the states. Yeah, Lindsey Graham sure kept to that energy. In the days and weeks following this decision, we must work to continue to reject extreme policies that seek to allow late-term abortions and taxpayer dollars to fund these elective procedures. The people's representatives must defend the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for every American, born and unborn. As we celebrate today's decision, we recognize the decades of advocacy from the pro-life movement, and we acknowledge much work remains to protect the most vulnerable among us. That's Republican leadership from California, Louisiana, and New York saying that fetuses deserve equal protection to pregnant people. Here are some Republican Congresswomen reacting to the Dobbs decision. Today's historic Supreme Court decision is a victory for the sanctity of life. It will save countless innocent children. House Republicans are incredibly grateful for the pro-life movement's tireless efforts for decades, leading to this day to give a voice to the voiceless and protect our most vulnerable, unborn babies. The court affirmed today that every life is worth living. My hope, my prayer is that America will reclaim our identity as a nation whose God-given rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness Amen. for all. I will say today as a mother and a, a grandmother, I am so incredibly grateful and gratified that the Supreme Court has finally overturned Roe versus Wade. This is an historic moment for families, for mothers, and for the precious unborn children who cannot protect themselves. Today, we do give voice to the voiceless. I have always been clear that every child deserves a chance to live. This was a big win, not only for South Texas, because we are pro-life, somos pro vida, but it's also a big win for our country. Representative Andrew Clyde of Georgia, First, thank you to the Supreme Court for removing the curse of abortion sanctioned by a federal court ruling back in 1973. Six Supreme Court justices have stood for life, and that is a beautiful thing. Next, do guns so children aren't massacred in schools. No? Not gonna prevent mass murders? Are you sure? Representative Bob Good of Virginia. Thank God for the hundreds of thousands of relentless pro-life activists, for millions of pro-life marchers, for tens of millions of pro-life voters, and thank God for the courage of six Supreme Court justices who withstood the pressure, the threats, the intimidation to do the right thing morally and constitutionally. Good for all those pro-lifers who frequently threaten to bomb and shoot up Planned Parenthoods, which do more than abortions, and those pro-lifers who threaten to kill people over abortion, including those that ended up in our comment section. You know, I'm starting to think they don't know what pro-life means. Ohio State Rep Gene Schmidt. Rape is a difficult issue and it emotionally scars the individual, all or in part, for the rest of their life, just as child abuse does. But if a baby is created, it is a human life, and whether that mother ends the pregnancy or not, the scars will not go away, period. It's a shame that it happens, but there's an opportunity for that woman, no matter how young or old she is, to make a determination about what she's going to do to help that life be a productive human being. Rape is bad, yes, but that doesn't matter for you because your life is already over. You're just a carrier for a potential life, and all that matters is that potential life that you must now dedicate your entire life to caring for because that's all you are. Minnesota Lieutenant Governor candidate Matt Burke. Rape is a horrible thing. Let me tell you, abortion is not going to heal a rape victim. It will only make things worse. Yeah, because it's so much better to have to carry, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions in a high cost of living area, to care for, raise, and live with this constant daily reminder of the worst moment of your life. Are you sure about that? New Hampshire Republican Senate nominee Don Boldick not only supports a national abortion ban, but is open to limiting in vitro fertilization. Describing fertility clinics' disposal of inviable or unused embryos, Boldick said, 
It's a disgusting practice. I don't like that practice at all, and I think it's a separate issue, and we've got to do something about it. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp also suggested he'd be excited to restrict IVF, but his campaign later backtracked. Reminder that forced childbirth supporter Brian Kemp is running against pro-choice Stacey Abrams, who many say would have defeated Kemp had Kemp not literally been in charge of running the election. Reminder that while Brian Kemp was overseeing an election in which he himself was a candidate, he openly did everything in his power to suppress Democratic voters, including flagging 53,000 primarily black voters registration for inconsistencies and closing over 200 polling places, primarily in poor and minority neighborhoods, causing an estimated 54 to 85,000 people to be unable to vote. And after all of that, Kemp won by less than 55,000 votes. Technically, there's nothing unconstitutional about overseeing your own election, and voter suppression is already commonplace, so... Vote for Stacey Abrams because she's pro-choice and won't try to restrict IVF. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz called the Dobbs decision nothing short of a massive victory for life, and it will save the lives of millions of innocent babies. I'm sure he's excited for the victory celebration in Cancun. He just seems to love running away from the suffering of the people he represents. Speaking of Texas, what did other Texas Republicans have to say after the Dobbs decision that triggered an abortion ban in Texas? Attorney General Ken Paxton celebrated on Twitter that abortion is now illegal in Texas and declared he would be closing his office and making it an annual holiday. Texas GOP Chair Matt Rinaldi called it a historic day which Republicans and pro-life advocates have waited for a generation. GOP Governor Greg Abbott said the Supreme Court correctly overturned Roe v. Wade and reinstated the right of states to protect innocent, unborn children. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. The left will surely fight to keep the abortion industry alive in Texas, but they will fail. But Texas isn't totally hopeless. Beto O'Rourke is currently running for governor in Texas, and Democratic candidates down ballot are fighting against the heavily gerrymandered map with the new redistricting. So if you're in Texas and haven't already made a plan to vote for him, what are you waiting for? Down ballot races really matter. One illustration of that is a letter the chair and vice chair of the Texas Democratic Party sent to Democratic sheriffs, district attorneys, and other local officials, urging them not to enforce Texas's abortion restrictions after the fall of Roe v. Wade. No matter what the United States Supreme Court says, abortion is a valid, safe, and important healthcare procedure that should never be restricted by any power or authority. Even if you live in a state where abortion is currently illegal, voting for pro-choice candidates down ballot will impact the enforcement of those bans. Remember that Atlanta and Savannah decriminalized abortion despite Georgia's statewide six-week ban? That's because of down-ballot city officials. And decriminalization matters even if clinics have to close. Reminder that the biggest provider of abortion care in the U.S. is the U.S. Postal Service. Telehealth providers in states with reproductive health care protections can still prescribe abortion pills, which are safe and effective for the vast majority of abortion cases. There is no law against shipping FDA-approved prescribed medication across state lines. So even if in-state clinics are shut down, local enforcement practices matter. Rochelle Garza, a former ACLU lawyer who worked on abortion rights, currently running for Texas Attorney General, vowed, I as Attorney General will not join in any sort of prosecution of people seeking access to abortion care. As Attorney General, she could make a real difference in whether pregnant people in Texas have options without changing any laws. So even if you feel helpless and trapped in a red state, you can still do a lot by voting up and down the ballot. In some states, your vote might even affect whether abortion is legalized or protected. We already saw an example of this in Kansas, where voters overwhelmingly struck down a ballot measure which would have banned abortion. So despite the 22-week ban and a ton of trap laws designed to make it unnecessarily more difficult to obtain an abortion, abortion is still legal in Kansas. These votes matter. So let's review the states with abortion-related ballot measures this November. We'll start with the lower stakes ones. 
California, a state where abortion is currently legal, has a ballot measure stating the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, which includes their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. The goal of this ballot measure is to hopefully reaffirm the right to abortion in their state. Vermont, where abortion is also currently legal and already has comprehensive protections, has a ballot measure to protect reproductive freedom in their constitution. So if you live in either of these states, vote yes to these measures. It's not super high stakes, but any protections are good. There's also a low stakes measure on the forced birth end. Kentucky, a state where abortion is banned except in the case of life-threatening medical situations, is asking voters to amend the state constitution to declare there is not a right to an abortion. So don't support this measure. It's not super high stakes, but you should still be voting so that politicians can hear that voters are pro-reproductive freedom. Montana, where abortion is legal up to viability, but there are several currently enjoined restrictions, including a 20-week ban, a 24-hour waiting period, and biased counseling, is asking voters whether to require medical care and treatment for infants born alive after an attempted abortion. This is fucked up, not just because infanticide is already illegal in every state, and NICU care for a few days can range from several thousand for a couple days to over half a million for a couple months, even if the infant doesn't survive, but because it perpetuates the lie of abortion survivors. Less than 1% of all abortions are done after 24 weeks, the point where a completely healthy fetus could be considered viable, usually because the fetus has a fatal condition or the pregnant person's life is at severe risk. Sometimes in those cases, a drug is used to stop the fetal heartbeat prior to the procedure, but often the patient chooses not to. In those cases, the procedure or induced labor is often fatal to the fetus. If the infant does survive childbirth, the parents can choose NICU or comfort care, usually at the recommendation of doctors based on the infant's viability. Because it's on the ballot in Montana, I need to mention the case-by-case -case nature of these medical decisions and the murky what counts as an abortion definitions. I am now going to present a hypothetical story, which is not based on a single story I've read or heard, but a combination of many. Do not try to track these people down. This specific case is not real. Say a doctor diagnoses an expectant mother with a potentially fatal complication for both baby and mother. The recommended treatment is to induce labor, so the terrified parents agree. When the baby arrives, the doctors determine that despite their best efforts, it is incompatible with life. This infant will most likely not survive, even with intensive and painful NICU care. The parents don't want to subject their child to unnecessary pain, so they elect comfort care, cuddling and holding their baby while doctors provide pain medication for a few hours until it passes away. This is a tragedy. Medically, it is also not different from a botched 37-week abortion. The difference between premature births where the baby died and late-term abortion survivors left to die is entirely in the phrasing and our assumptions about the intent of those involved. Now, imagine this Montana ballot measure passes. These parents no longer get a choice. The baby is resuscitated, sent to the NICU, subjected to dozens of tests, medical interventions, and every possible avenue of care, but it doesn't work just like the doctors predicted. The parents are given a few hours of false hope, are further traumatized by this experience, and aren't able to process their grief as effectively. The infant still dies quickly in more pain without its parents. This is also a tragedy. And now the parents have a $6,000 NICU bill that their insurance doesn't cover because while the hospital was in network, the NICU was not because that's how subcontracted NICUs work. It would be so much easier if we had universal health care, wouldn't it? So if you're in Montana, please vote against this horrendous ballot measure. Although on the surface it seems at worst like a redundant propaganda law, its effects would be far more devastating. Homicide is illegal. 
Infanticide is illegal. And frankly, until we start treating medical care as a right in the US rather than a luxury commodity, forcing expensive medical treatment on people against their wishes is hypocritical. <sighs> okay, after that Montana mess, I need some good news. And that good news is coming from Michigan, where technically abortion is illegal. But recently, the enforcement of its 1931 abortion ban was blocked by Michigan Court of Claims Judge Elizabeth Gleischer. So abortion might be protected, at least for now, pending further litigation. It's tenuous protection at best. Enter Proposal 3, Reproductive Freedom for All. The measure would amend the state's constitution to make reproductive freedom a right, repealing the 1931 law that makes abortion a felony. So Michiganders vote yes to Proposition 3, the right to make and effectuate decisions about all matters related to pregnancy, including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion care, miscarriage management, and infertility care. I cannot stress enough how important this vote is. And I know I have viewers in Michigan. Make a plan to vote by mail, early, or on election day. Even if you feel disillusioned and like neither party represents you, please vote. Vote because real people who want to pursue IVF would really like it to stay legal. Vote because when Trump took office, there was an immediate hiring freeze at all national labs, hurting science and the job prospects of 2017 college graduates. Vote because climate change is real and many of us are personally affected by the smoke from fires on the West Coast. And even though Democrats aren't doing enough or close to it, Harm mitigation could save hundreds of millions of lives and billions of people from becoming climate refugees. Both options suck, but I'd rather eat a moldy piece of bread than get shot several times in the stomach. Phone bank and knock on doors if you have time. Check with your friends and family to make sure they vote. And just maybe. Showing up to the polls and voting overwhelmingly for pro-science Democrats up and down the ballot might mean that I never have to hear the names Joe Manchin, Susan Collins, or Kristen Cinema ever again. Astra out. Ad Astra, Ad Astra, to the stars, to the stars. much to everyone who watched this video and especially to my patrons. Science is and has always been political, both affecting and affected by societal biases. But normally I try not to be as directly political in videos. If you would like to see me do more videos where I talk a bit more about politics, let me know in the comments down below. I want to make science exciting and accessible for everyone. And if you enjoyed this type of video, I can make more videos like this. Have a great day. Remember to vote. Astra out. You're such a good girl. I'm over here. Recently, Democrats passed... Oh God, she did a yawn, it was so cute.